I'm just going to kind of jump right in today because um, we have a lot to cover. Um, there are a lot of scriptures again. Uh, I'm talking about uh, protecting ourselves and, and our loved ones from wolves. Uh, this is part of a, a, a series mixed in with our theme that the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps from Proverbs 16, 9. Uh, I kind of pointed out that a large part of Jesus' ministry was spent uh, warning people, warning people about other people, not about the trappings of the world so much, um, though he did do that, but a lot of his ministry was warning people about people who are intent on causing harm. Uh, so why do I spend so much time on it? Uh, why are we spending a series, especially right around Father's Day? Um, seems kind of strange to, to be doing a, a series on helping you to identify wolves who are in sheep's clothing. Um, here's part of why I do what I do and why I think it's so important that we learn how to protect our loved ones and ourselves from, from people whose intent is only to harm. Uh, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services uh, released, um, released a, a, a study on their findings from 2015. Uh, it was updated and published again in 2018. And the title of the original article was, um, let's see if I can find it here. This is like really tiny print, so I keep trying to zoom in on my phone and it's, it's not working out really well. Um, I think it was just titled Child Abuse Neglect, um, 2018. Uh, the CDC has reposted this, but it's called The Economic Burden of Child Maltreatment in the United States, 2015. Um, and I'm just going to read an abstract from this. And I think it's really important for us to really understand the numbers behind this and the significance of what abuse has uh, both economically and just on the mental health of people just in our nation. Child maltreatment uh, incurs a high lifetime cost per victim and creates a substantial U.S. population economic burden. This study aimed to use the, the most recent data and recommended methods to update previous 2008 estimates of one, the per victim lifetime cost, and two, the annual U.S. population um, economic burden of child maltreatment. That's a mouthful. Uh, three ways to update the previous estimates were identified. Um, number one, apply value per statistical life methodology to the value child maltreatment mortality. And two, apply monetized quality adjustment uh, life years. I'm going to skip down to the, to the actual numbers. Updated methods increase the estimate of non-fatal child maltreatment per victim lifetime cost. In other words, victims who don't die. They're abused. They're still alive. They're still living and breathing. The per cost per victim was updated from $210,012 to $830,928 in 2015 and increased the fatal per victim cost from one3 to to, now listen to this, from $1.3 million to $16.6 That's a huge adjustment. In other words, the lifetime cost that one victim will incur for the rest of their lives, living, breathing people who've been abused, will incur $16 million dollars in medical that's from chronic health issues uh, mental health uh, counseling costs 16.6 million dollars per victim the estimated u.s population economic burden of child maltreatment based on 2015 substantiated incident cases was 428 billion dollars representing lifetime cost incurred annually Using estimated incident of investigated annual incident cases, the estimated economic burden was, listen to this, $2 trillion. Now this is, this is in terms of money, costs incurred from people being abused. This is, 
directly to the victim, which means those victims will have chronic illnesses, like I mentioned. They're going to be in and out of, of um, addiction facilities. They're going to suffer with chronic depression. Uh, these are generational impacts that are placed on the family, and that's just per victim. Um, I think if, if, if we look at what's going on across the nation in recent news, um, I was just interviewed a, a little bit ago uh, by a reporter a few days ago, and he was talking about um, all these stories, these bombshell stories that are coming out. And he said, do you think that there's something going on in the atmosphere that's leading to all of these stories coming out all at the same time, like huge stories? And I said, no, I, I think... I think what we're seeing is kind of a, a compound interest effect, if you will, of abuse upon abuse upon abuse. Uh, we had the recent shooting in Uvalde, Texas. Uh, since then, uh, actually in, in 10 days after Uvalde, those numbers have increased, I'm sure, there have been 10, uh, sorry, 20 mass shootings here in the United States. A mass shooting is defined as four victims or more who are injured or killed. Uh, a mass homicide is defined as four dead victims or more. A mass shooting is identified as four people by one shooter who've been, who've been murdered or um, injured. 20 since Uvalde. They're so common that it doesn't even register with us. We don't even, it, 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 it's like one is terrible, but they're happening so fast and in such succession that we're, that it doesn't even, unless it's a major shooting like Uvalde was, it doesn't even register. It doesn't even affect us anymore. And if you think about what it takes on a macro level, what does it take for somebody to actually go through with it? Because, I, I mean, I don't know about you and I. Have anybody here have a bad day? Like a really bad day ever? <laughs> right? At your absolute worst. Your absolute lowest. It's not even a thought. To pull out a weapon of any kind. And to slay people. It's not even a thought. On our absolute lowest Worst of the worst, absolute most horrific day. We have a mental health crisis in this nation. There's this compound interest where people are not well. You can see it all over the place. You can see it on street corners. You can see people who are not well, people who are not stable, people who are not doing well mentally. This is a crisis. And a lot of that, um, as we talked about last week, is because there are people out there who are intent on harming people. And the Bible has a lot to say about people who are intent on harming innocent people. Jesus, I assure you, has zero mercy for people whose only intention is to harm other people. So how do we identify? How do we identify them? And how do we... Um, how do we realize what the characteristics are of them? This week we're going to talk about characteristics that I found, that I've observed, and that I think Scripture um, paints a pretty clear picture. That people who are wolves, that is people who don't change, that is people who, who will never produce good fruit. They'll pretend to produce good fruit. They'll blend in really well with the rest of us. They'll, they'll quote Bible Scriptures. Um, a lot of them are, are preaching and teaching, but they're abusing victims. They're creating victim after victim after victim. And the Bible, I think, paints a really, really clear distinction between sinners like you and I, who genuinely wrestle with sin. Charles and I were having a conversation before class, um, a really good conversation. And I think some of the people who we put on a pedestal in the scriptures... Um, it, when you dig a little bit deeper, your head would spin and you'd be like, I don't know that I'd be comfortable worshiping beside this person. I mean, some wild things. Uh, we're talking about polytheism, that a lot of the people who we love and admire in the scriptures, some of the spiritual giants in scripture were polytheistic. They worshiped multiple gods. And yet the Bible is clear that the worst of the worst of the worst 
of the worst of the worst are people who pretend to be righteous, but whose only intent is to harm other people. Um, I put a picture up here because um, I'll go back to the scripture that Dave read, but I put a picture. This is my luck when I try to trap things, you know, like I set traps out and I wind up with a cute little kitty cat, you know, like I'm trying to trap rodents and things like that. But um, or Natalie and I put traps all over um, the learning lamp and and the mice like avoid them like a plague. Um, this is my luck, you know, I'm not good at trapping. I'm not good at trapping animals. I'm certainly not good at trapping people. But the Bible makes this distinction and talks about people who entrap or ensnare other people. Uh, if you are good at trapping and you don't catch cute little kitty cats, um, if you're good at trapping, you know that you have to be pretty smart about it. Uh, you have to have the right type of trap. You have to put them in the right place. You have to outsmart the animals. You have to bait them. You have to lure them into the trap. There's a lot that goes into trapping. There's a lot that goes into it. It's kind of a mind game, actually. It's not as easy as just setting a trap and putting it out there and, you know, the animal just kind of casually walks into it and there you have it. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it. And so the Bible makes this clear distinction. So we're going to talk about these characteristics. And I, I didn't put many. Uh, I'm trying to keep this pretty simple. So I've boiled it down. But this is, uh, this is a truth for all wolves. And, and again, the Bible talks about wolves as people who do not, will not, cannot change. They will never change. They will never repent. And by the way, um, I absolutely 100% would classify my own father as a wolf. He will never repent. Never. Never. And I've visited with him in prison. I've read countless letters from prison. He loved abusing victims. And he loves talking about it. I know it's difficult for some of you who knew, knew him your entire lives, but he will never, ever repent. That picture is so clear to me right now. He will never repent. And so what are characteristics of all wolves? Number one, they're predators who trap their prey. They set traps for people and lure them in. That's a difference between getting caught up in sin, right? We all know what that's like. We all know what it's like to have passions and to be like impassioned in the moment and to do something. And then you're like, what did I just do? That's not what, it, what wolves do. They're predators who trap their prey. They're meticulous about it. They think about it. They, they live and breathe thinking about how they're going to trap their prey. And here are some of the scriptures. We, we read um, big parts of these last week and we're going to kind of break it down a little bit more this week. Uh, into smaller bits. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 14. It says, They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. It, it, it's glamorized. They love sin. It motivates them. It energizes them. They entice unsteady souls. See the trapping? They entice people. They reel people in. They lure them in. Hearts trained in greed. Accursed children. And then verses 28 and 29 of the same chapter. That's not right because there is no verse 28. So I wrote it down wrong. Uh, I believe it's 18 and 19 is what I meant. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh, those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. In other words, they find really vulnerable people and they entice them and they reel them in. They promise them freedom. I'll make your life better. I'll show you what it's really like to be loved. I'll give you what you never got from anybody else. They promise them freedom. But they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever comes, overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. And then 2 Timothy chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 6 and 7. 
2 Timothy 3, verses 6 and 7 says this, For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never, uh, never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Do you see the trap setting? They go in, they find weak and vulnerable people, and they set the trap and they reel them in. They lure them in. They entice them. And by the way, Paul's message is to avoid these people. Stay away from them. Have nothing to do with them. And I want to contrast this for a second with Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. And this is really interesting to me. Because this passage says, Brothers, if anyone is caught and trapped and snared, lured in. If any one of you is lured in, in other words, if you're the victim, not the one setting the trap, but the one walking into the trap, anybody who is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Restoration for the people being led into the trap and condemnation for the people who are setting the traps. There's a clear distinction in scriptures. How about number two? They're deliberate. They're intentional. They're instinctive. And they actually find pleasure in what they've destroyed. Um, I will tell... A little bit of a personal story, and I don't remember if I've shared this here. Um, I haven't shared this story very many times. I'm certainly not going to divulge details. I will spare you of that. Uh, the last time I visited my father in prison was in 2018, uh, October of 2018. Um, quite possibly the last visit that I will ever make um, in person. Um, during that visit, I saw with my own eyes, I had read about it in letters, but this time I actually saw the mannerisms and the expression on his face as he recounted the victims that he abused. I watched him smile. I watched his body posture relax. I watched him light up as he talked about the victims he produced. He wasn't thinking about it in a remorseful way or saying, my God, what have I done? It was quite the opposite. This motivated him, this energized him, this made him excited to talk about how he was able to bring them in, how he was able to trap them and ensnare them. It really did a number mentally on me, um, and I just have no interest in having any connection with him. These people are deliberate. I can never overstate this, that they're deliberate, they're intentional, they're instinctive. They do it instinctively. Peter talks about that. And they actually find pleasure in what they've destroyed. They don't lose sleep at night over what they've done. Hebrews chapter 10, we read from this last week. Um, I, want to, I want to read just this verse again. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26, it says, For if we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Um, Second Peter, again, Second Peter chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Listen how Peter describes them. But these, like irrational animals... Creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about the matters to which they're ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. You know, it's interesting because Peter's describing preachers in this context. These are prophets. He calls them false prophets. These are preachers, people who are out preaching the word of God to people. And listen how Peter describes them. There's no room for mercy. There's no room for grace. Peter doesn't say, well, let's, let's work with them here. Heck, Peter doesn't say what Paul said. You remember Paul, when people kind of narked out um, 
the other preachers and they're like, Paul, they're saying all kinds of bad things about you. Their motives in preaching is to take you down. And what was Paul's response to that? What was his response? You can shout it out. Was it to stop them? It wasn't, was it? Paul said, if what they're preaching is true, let them be. If their motive is to take me down, but what they're doing is, is, is true and right, let them alone. You know why Paul said that? You know why Paul had confidence in saying that? Because they weren't wolves. There's a difference between people being tempted and, and, and taking down somebody's reputation, being a gossip, things like that. There's a difference between that and somebody who plans meticulously to destroy somebody's innocence. So even for people like that, Paul doesn't classify them as false preachers. Paul says, yeah, their motives are to take my reputation down. Knock yourselves out. Don't stop them from preaching the word of God. That's interesting. And then finally, number three, they're ravenous. What is ravenous? What does that mean? You can shout it out. What's ravenous? Anybody? What does a ravenous person do? Yeah, and, and you what? You destroy somebody of your kind. You annihilate them. They're ravenous. Those are Jesus' words, or that's Jesus' word. They're ravenous, soul destroyers, and they are exceptionally deceptive. Charles, in class this morning, you brought up a point that people who are living in self-deception think that they're good with God. It's not like they're doing these things and, and, and they're like, okay, I'm, I'm, I am an evil villain here to take the world down. They're people who genuinely believe that them and God, they and God, are super tight. They're, and, and I think that's what makes them really dangerous. Because a lot of people will come back, and a lot of Christians will come back and they'll say, but look at all the good that they're doing in their lives. And wrong. There is no good in these people. And the Bible makes a clear distinction between them, again, and people like us who do a lot of bad in our lives, but we're not intent on destroying innocent people. There's a difference between people who struggle with sin. Oftentimes their entire lives they struggle with sin. And people who love destroying people who are ravenous, who would destroy and annihilate the souls of other people, and they'll walk away from it and they'll smile. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, this is Jesus talking here. And this is in that passage that Dave read for us this morning. Matthew chapter 7, thank you for pointing it out. <laughs> He's back there with the pointer on, on Matthew 7. <laughs> Beware of false prophets. Again, what are they doing by profession, so to speak? They're preaching. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. In other words, they look like you, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And then 2 Timothy so our last passage here, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're just going to read this larger part of this. Because I think it's so important to hear what, what Paul's saying. Paul says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness. In other words, what do they look like? Who do they look like? Us. 
They have the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. Paul could not be more clear on this point. Paul never says, neither does Jesus say, nor does Peter say, nor does anybody say in the scriptures. Find people like this who are really troubled in their souls and minister to them. Give them the word of God. Give them the gospel because all people have some good in their heart. Everybody, have you ever heard that? Everybody has a little corner of their heart where there's good. You just need to find it and nurture it and help that to grow. That is a false statement. It couldn't be farther from the truth. That is false, false, false. There are some people, I don't think a lot of people, but there are some people, enough people out there in the world who are intent on only, only intent on harming other people. And they are really good pretenders. Really good. And the Bible's message, God's message, over and over and over, is avoid them. Stay away from them. Have nothing to do with them. Have you ever read Proverbs? Proverbs has a little bit to say about people like that. Stay away from them. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning they're smart people. They're knowledgeable people, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. In other words, they're always learning, but they're unteachable. You ever meet anybody who has an unteachable spirit? No matter what you say until you're blue in the face, they just don't get it. Skipping down, because I'm really up against time again. Verse 13. Actually, verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. They don't get better, they only get worse. There is a classification in Scripture over and over and over and over again, where people are identified as bad trees who don't bear good fruit, wolves in sheep's clothing, um, on and on and on. There are descriptors of these people who will not ever change. Stay away from them. Um, next week, we'll go a little bit further. Um, we're going to wrap this up in the next couple of weeks. But I want to give you really clear identifiers for how we actually find these people. Uh, the message is yours. Be safe. Stay away from people who are nasty. Um, <laughs> And if there's anybody this morning who has any prayer needs or anybody who has not taken that step to put Christ on a baptism, we invite you.